I'm about a week in, so I'm doing the logic games right now, um, which is great. And I think what was frustrating the first time around when I took the LSAT, I used the Kaplan books, and it was just a lot of focus on the minuscule fundamentals of how to do, like, how to approach each sentence and everything. And, and having that foundation initially is good rolling into this course because then I can use that, but also it's more elaborate through your course. So things are really like they're actually making sense. So that's a plus. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear it's, it's working well for you. So yeah. What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? Uh, I would say the substitution questions have given me kind of some fits. Like if this was substituted for this constraint and I'm just wondering, are there, are there phrases or words or tricks that I could use to, to kind of make those a bit easier, I guess. Yeah, sure. So you're talking rule substitution questions in logic games? Yeah. Yeah. And what I'll recommend is not really a trick. It's more of a way to just get better at them, just to familiarize yourself with them, which is, first off, to do a bunch of them in a row. Just do the setup for the game and then only the rule substitution question associated with that game. Okay. These have appeared on nearly every exam since exam 57, sometimes twice per exam. Mm -hmm. but they're still infrequent enough that it's hard to get into a rhythm on them. Yeah. But the truth is they're not really that difficult, actually. They only seem difficult because they're unusual. And so what I'll recommend for you is do a bunch of them in a row. You could do every single one in a row if you want. I have a list of them I'll send you. Okay. And the yeah, idea that'd be is, great. Yeah, of course. So the idea is look, do the setup, the main diagram only, then do that specific question, and you'll start to see some patterns organically. Okay. I have another recommendation for you as well. When you're solving it in context through doing an entire game, look for over, look, looking over your previous scenarios that you've drawn as well as the orientation question, check each choice against those. And the wrong answers will violate one of those sometimes. They may be more limiting than the original rules. And if they're more limiting, then they would render any previous valid scenario invalid. And as a result, they could not possibly be equivalent. Okay. Also, that makes sense. also, the correct answer should lead to the same general inferences that the original rules did, and it may even be the inference itself. The main, and the other thing you could do is you could take a given choice and combine it with the other rules and see if you end up with a generally similar main diagram. That's not imposing anything new and also not allowing anything that previously would not have been permitted. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Um, and so I noticed in doing the uh, the test, the numerical guides like using the box game with the red, white, and green balls, and you know figuring out uh, you know the possible combinations three, two, one, or three, one, two, or so on and so forth. When do you? How do you know when to use those? Good question. You use them whenever it makes sense to you. Whenever you see it. So <laughs> okay. if you have categories within your variable set, that's an indication that numerical distributions might be useful. So if you have, let's say you have nine variables and there's three categories for each of those three, then you can have a distribution where you're thinking about the category level, not the specific variable level. And so you can kind of play around on a meta level where you're playing with categories, not the variables. It lets you get a bird's eye view of all the possibilities without listing every single one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and when it comes to those, uh, just understanding that you have about eight and a half minutes per game, uh, how much, just dividing up that time and, and focusing on that time management on the outset of it, and just kind of determining, and I'm sure it's all, you know, subjective, but, uh, or objective, I should say, but um, when do you, like, how do you know how much time you're spending on it and should spend on it and all that? And I'm sure you've heard that question a hundred thousand times. Sure, I have. I have, but it's no less relevant despite that. And a couple things I'll say. One is that you have an average of 845 per game, but that's an average that you're imposing on yourself and you don't necessarily need to. You have 35 minutes for four games. How you choose to allocate that is totally up to you. So some games are easier than others, meaning you should allocate time differently between different games based on the difficulty level. So a game involving numerical distribution will on average be a tougher game you might want to devote more time there. So maybe that game gets 11 minutes, let's say. And if it gets 11 minutes, then you could afford to spend three minutes or maybe even four 
simply on the initial setup. And whether you choose to do two minutes or four minutes or three, it's entirely up to you. Part of it's also personal preference. Some people like to do a ton of work up front and then they'll see that as paving the way to make the questions a breeze. Others may not see as much up front and in some games there may not even be as much to do up front and in those cases, you'll do less work up front and more work over the course of the game. Okay. So like so many things, it depends, it varies, but those are a, yeah. few, a few general frameworks. Starting numerical distributions, just one last thing on that is that aside from categories of variables, you can also look at allocations of slots. That's also another way to see, to use that tactic. So maybe if column two is always twice the amount of column one, then you could have column one has one, two has two, or column one has two slots and column two has four slots. So those are also some other ways to play around with it, leading you to multiple main diagrams as well. And in terms of using that, just fully manipulating the 35 minutes for the logic game section or any section for that matter, is the test for the sections, are they designed like, you're not gonna get four games that are ex of the same extreme hardness or the same extreme easiness. I mean, is it, it, so I guess if you, like you were saying, allocate 11 minutes for a game and then you have, you know, six minutes for another game, um, is that, is that kind of the way the test is built? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's built so that on average, the sections should be in roughly equal difficulty, but okay. it's roughly, there is definitely variation between exams. One exam, like let's say just hypothetically, exam number one may have harder games, easier reasoning. Exam number two may have harder reading comp, easier everything else. It can totally vary. But it's mm -hmm. not intentionally, they're, not, they're never going to intentionally put four super tough logic games. But there is some natural variation and the general consensus will confirm that on a given exam overall. So there is probably some truth to that variation at the same time. There's also personal preference and variation as well. So if you're really strong in games and you get an exam that has tough games, it might have gone smoothly for you, but terribly for most other people. Mm -hmm. But on average, they're not going to put four super tough games or four super tough reading comps. You'll typically see, let's say, one easy, two medium, one difficult, but it varies. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned a lot uh, in the blogs and the podcasts and these videos, uh, just trying to identif identify which questions may be tough, which to flag, which to skip, which to, you know, and all that stuff. How do you, and again, it, it's probably more depends, but... Uh, how do you identify those? Because it seems when I watch your, your recaps, so what I'll do is I'll do the games, I'll, and then I'll go back and I'll work, rework through them with you and how you explain them just to make sure that my thinking is on the right track. And sometimes it just feels like that you just like it's so obvious to skip that question, but how do I get to that level? Yeah, so in games, I would skip a question if I don't have enough information in the moment to solve it efficiently. So in games, typically, I'll have a global must be true question, let's say, and I don't have enough information at that moment. Maybe I didn't see the initial inference or maybe that inference simply wasn't one one would naturally get at the beginning because it's so such a random little thing. And so in those cases, I'll say, you know what? Not enough information. I don't want to test out all five choices because that would take too long. That's called brute forcing and is inefficient even if it is ultimately effective. Doesn't work in the time constraint. So I'd rather skip it, do some more local diagrams, which means drawing out more hypotheticals, getting more evidence under my belt so that when I circle back to that global must be true question, I then have gotten more information to arm myself to better knock out a couple of choices at least. So even if I am drawing out a couple of scenarios, I'm drawing two rather than five. So that's, that's in the games context. In the logical reasoning context, it's more if I'm going to be like a deer in headlights moment where I'm frozen because something is just so strange to me or difficult in the moment, or just really time consuming like parallel reasoning or principal application or something that's really focused on science or philosophy that just seems too tough for me to wrap my head around. I'll say, since everything's worth the same, why get bogged down on this? Let me finish this section and come back to it and handle the lower hanging fruit first. Come back to the most difficult things. Maybe I get them, maybe I don't, but also with a fresh perspective and some distance, that might also help me break out of the, out, break out of the tunnel vision so I can maybe, maybe get right through that alone. And that actually works a lot of the time. And you might not get everyone, but at least you're knocking out what you're more likely to get correct. And you think that's something that you should obviously practice on the press practice exams when you do it, when you do these sections, 
just practice skipping questions and coming back? Yeah, anything that you would do on test day, you should do in your practice, especially if you're doing timed sections or timed exams where you're looking to simulate your pacing. And that part of that involves your strategy for when to skip, when to come back. And since everything's worth the same, there's no reason not to skip things. And on the digital LSAT and the flex, they make the flagging really easy. You can see at a glance everything you haven't touched and you can flag it so you know, okay, number 17, I'm going to return to that once I get to the end. Mm -hmm. And it also helps okay. you just keep the momentum going, which I think is really important. Because yeah. once you get bogged down, it's, it's hard to let go of that. It's like the sunk cost fallacy. You just get, get deeper, deeper into that, <laughs> but you still might not get it right. So rather just break it, come back. Okay. Cool. Uh, that helps me. I, and I mean, I guess in taking the, now the second time around, I took it in May uh, and obviously using this next month or so to get ready for the July one. And I found on the, the first time I took it and granted it was the first time I took a test of any type in like eight years. So uh, it was nice to get it out of the way, but reading comprehension, I, did, I didn't spend a whole lot of time studying on that uh, the first time around because it, for me, it's like, you read, you figure it out, and you go from there, right? So now going the second time around, what are some of the, the maybe the broad strokes of things that I should be more so focusing on? Granted, and I haven't gotten to that part in the course yet, but just so that I kind of have it in the front of my mind before approaching it. Yeah, sure. The biggest thing I'll say is, again, not getting bogged down in details. Focus on the main idea, the author's opinion, the primary purpose. So the broad strokes, aim to walk away with that, where you could summarize the main idea in a keyword or key phrase. And then you knock out those questions first, then the details, you can always go back to them. But this is not right. testing you for the content. It's not about memorizing facts. You can go back and find the facts. They're much more concerned with the author's opinion and then how the author, as well as any other parties in the passage, go about making their arguments. So kind of like in logical reasoning, you have role of the statement questions. You have method of reasoning questions. You have similar things in reading comp as well. And so that's the kind of thing they're, they're looking for is to see if you understand the arguments presented and how they go about making those. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Well, I think, I mean, that really helps me. I, for me, this course has been great because it's, you know, like I said, I used the Kaplan books the first time and it was so, you know, you, you gotta be a self-starter in, in a lot of this too, but what I like about your day-to-day -day schedule is that I, I know exactly what I'm going to do, exactly when I get it done, I feel good about where I'm at, and so for that, I'm very appreciative of your uh, detailed and um, all the exercises that you give, so thanks for that. Awesome, Benjamin, really glad to hear it. Please keep in touch, let me know if you need anything, and I'll see you in class soon. Okay, thanks, Steve, appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.